Welcome to Polycast, a civilization podcast focused on game strategy. Dan Q. Makalua. The Mian Team. Ed Jin. With guest co host, Dragonall. I need coffee number two. <laughs> Only on number two, you slacker. No, I'm kidding. <clears throat> Finer, bigger. <laughs> what? Can you not juxtapose that with number two? <laughs> Well, if those are bigger, that's your problem, not mine. <laughs> your problem is even getting your hand around it. <laughs> that is a terrible juxtaposition. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. You're I'm talking about holding God. coffee cups. What are you guys talking about? Welcome. Welcome to Polycast 228. And I am joined today with Dan Quick. Ribbit. Oh, very clever. All right. <laughs> We got the me team, me I team. I Greetings know. to all my citizens, and it's the me and team. All right, and Maka Hula La La La. You make Mackie sound even more exotic. I like this. <laughs> well, he's keeping up the long tradition of people not pronouncing my username right. So hey. Well, I see Lua in there, and all I think is scripting. So I, I... <laughs> nerd. <laughs> uh, yeah, pot kettle much there, Dan. <laughs> I'm a cool guy, though. We Finish are the here. intro. <laughs> no, that's all I have on my list here. Uh, did you forget to start genie in a bottle? Oh, man, that's a slight, too. Look at that. Genies and Dijins, really? Oh, I see <laughs> Majin down there. I just thought you meant wanted to be a regular host on the show, and since Majin is the least senior on the show, he'd be the first out, so you'd taken his place, and I didn't have to mention him. That's what I thought you were doing. Oh, no, I saw that. I missed Majin. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't I supposed to take you guys out so that I end up getting the longest co-host? I thought that was the plan. Yeah, how's that going? <laughs> yeah, how is that going? Wait, oh, it's not. I, I don't know. The plug, our games, the Galactic Civilization 6, or 6, 3, that just came out. <laughs> and they, I got 6, six, six out. out. We're just doubling everything? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Oh. All right. Brad Wardell, Stardock CEO, announces Civilization 6. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Six. There's a headline for you. Civil <laughs> Civ 6. Woo-hoo. Got so bored, we're pulling the Microsoft, just skipping a couple of versions. Yeah, no, we would call it Galactic Civilization 10 if we were doing that. Oh, Go right. oh no, you're, you're just trying to catch well, he up. He announced Gal Civ 6 and Civ 6. Yeah, what I'm saying is Brad announced Fraxis and 2K Games Civilization 6. Yeah, I knew. Yeah. That would be awesome, actually, have someone from one game company announce the title of another game company's next title. That, actually, that would be impressive. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I feel like pretty safe to say there's going to be a Civilization 6 at some point. Yeah, a wildly popular heavy sales <laughs> title in a long-running series that people will probably buy again. It's a safe bet, yes. Nope, yes. they're done. That's it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> It's like five bucks <laughs> enough. <laughs> We're good. Even like ten years from now. Come on, Sif. Nope. Sif 5 was perfect. We're not doing another one. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I think they like money. Yeah. Yeah, most people like money. That's yeah. true. Yeah, the question is, is how many more expansions we'll get versus... Uh... Well, yeah, that's a realistic question. Other than will there be a Sif 6 is how long until they are done milking the DLC for other stuff. Well, I think either way, if and when Civilization VI is announced, you will respond to those threads, Brad, and you'll be like, called it. Yeah. yeah. I knew, you know what? I knew it would be called Civilization VI years ago. I was way ahead of the curve. Yeah. Now I'm going to use this time to say about Civilization VII. You know what the real question is, though? When they do the VI, will it still be Roman numerals, or will they go over to integers now? No, it'll be it's a really mess with people. Yeah, it'll really mess with people. Is that four? Or six. I don't know. You got a V and an I. They got it backwards. <laughs> if that needs one thread, it needs ten. Isn't a culture victory redundant in Civilization V is the question. Sure. <laughs> Posted by Ruler of the Hex. Ooh, scary. I like hexing rituals, personally. I, I approve. To succeed culturally, you need a high-tech rate, good faith output, and tall cities. 
Realistically, these are all values represented in a science victory. Culture victories don't differ much from SVs, but the main difference being specialist focus. Of course, SVs being science victories. But if culture victories barely change from science victories, aren't they redundant? Don't you go, mm. like, mass linking mm-hmm. scientists to bald techs in science victories? You so also use... you, you still have specialist focus either way, too. But you also use lots of scientists specialists to mass bald the culture techs in the late game. Yeah. <laughs> You're just going a slightly different part of the tech tree. No. Nope. Basically, the answer is yes and no. If you're looking at it purely from a tech point of view, then yes, it's actually culture and diplomacy are actually the two very redundant ones because they're literally exactly one tech off. In culture, you go to this tech. In diplomacy, you go to that tech. They're side so by side. Pretty different win conditions. Well, yeah, but if you take it from a purely science form of view, then yes, you need to play it both the exact same. It's just that instead of generating culture and tourism and collecting things, you're collecting city-states and tech path-wise, how many scientists you need, how you play, it's all basically the same. Now, that all said, you do have all the whole tourism thing and the very different setup with all the uh, great works and everything. So there is actual mechanics that are separate from a science victory if you put away the fact that you just need massive amount of science. And for completeness sake, we are, of course, talking about the culture victory introduced in Brave New World, not the initial culture victory yeah. in Vanilla Civ 5. The plug our game, Galactic Civilizations 3, that just came out, it has culture flipping. So you actually build up your culture, and it's a completely distinct tech tree. So then you build a cultural star basis to expand your culture okay. into new hexes and slowly take them okay. over. And I'm wondering how much of that will fall into – because Civilization Four had that. And that was a nice mechanic where you were culture flipping other civilizations. Yeah, it was Dan's favorite. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that counts as cultural victory in as much as the old style conquest or whatever the take X percentage of the map. Domination. Yeah, it used to be domination or what? I mean, depends on the game, depends Mm -hmm. on what it felt. I don't know if that's really cultural, though. If you do that, you can just go conquer everybody and then it's like, I've got all the space. Well, no, that was just something to have like a Cold War, like, you know, you're pressuring tiles, but military was much more efficient in any game I've played than that. The culture victory in 4 was just to get three cities over X cultural growth value. Yeah, yeah. But that's like, these things all tend to just get same basic mechanic, but just change names in various games to get pushed to a different name for victory. But an actual culture victory really shouldn't be aggressively militaristic in taking over the world, unless you're stealing people's stuff, like in Civ 5. Like in Civ 5, you're stealing people's great works to help your culture victory. Although that is one of the faster ways to win it, is to beat everyone down so they can't defend themselves. Well, I was even going to say, I have not pursued a culture victory in Brave New World, and I tried that in Vanilla Civ 5 and got quickly bored with it. And I hate to make this analogy because I love domination victories in Civ V, but I kind of link them together in the sense of, would you like to eliminate AI? Because if you eliminate AI in domination, then you take over the map, you've got more territory. But if you eliminate AI for culture victories, then, hey, my culture is more dominant because guess what? There's one less and another less. And another? Yeah. It's a bit of the problem on the design side where going for one victory condition sort of means that you're already headed towards a couple others at the same time. Or using the others will get you to the one. It's good that there's multiple victories, obviously, because obviously different ways to play is a good thing. But when all those ways to play kind of get amalgamated based on good strategy, that's where the designs start breaking down You heard it here first, listeners. Imagine is advocating for a return of the Apostolic Palace victory. (laughs) (laughs) The Apostolic Palace is one of the most broken things in Civ 4, like, ever. Ever. Just complete trash. Like, you could win on Deity with one city if you set it up properly. Like, while you're, like, 30 techs behind everyone else. (laughs) (laughs) You win a diplomatic victory because you have no opponents running against you. Thumbs up. Yep, a.k.a. the religious victory. Yeah. And to me, in Civilization V, you can still accomplish that, only that's through using the religion mechanic, which actually you could use to support any number of quote-unquote formal victory conditions. Hmm. But if you're behind, you can win. buy out a bunch of city-states and still get diplomatic if the AI doesn't kill them all. Or, you know, <laughs> the whole nuking people to death and then accidentally getting a diplomatic victory. Well, yeah, although I like Civ IV's version of that better. Yeah. But that's, yeah, that's still a thing. It's still a thing in, in Civ V. I managed to do that as Venice. Yeah. 
By accident. <laughs> accident. So I think what it comes down to is if there are going to be multiple victory conditions, that they should not all rely on some core mechanic. Yeah, I agree. Or at least not all rely on the exact same core mechanic. Like in Civ Five, it's all science. The majority of it should be off mechanics and should have the game be able to do many things. Yeah, and then you have to balance between investing in that victory condition versus investing in science and military and staying alive. Yeah. And I like that factor better. I think that's something that Civ Four got right with culture victories, despite that they were also boring, like vanilla Civ Five culture victories. But you did have a distinctive thing, because you would switch your slider to culture, and as a result, your science tech would be miserable. So you, if you went all in on culture, you had to be pretty sure you are going to get there before you got killed. Well, as long as you don't need the science to get other culture, definitely uh, yeah, part of but the point. Before, you would get all the stuff you needed to win at an optimal speed about halfway into the tech tree. I really last. Mm-hmm. I would say more like a third of the way into the tech tree. As soon as you hit liberalism, you know, maybe you would get uh, printing press, but that's it. Then you're done. You stop teching if you want to get it as fast as possible. But that's mm-hmm. assuming you don't get killed. Yeah. <laughs> so even up to that point, then, science is significant. Yeah. The majority of the game, really, you would be pursuing culture then, rather than science. Yeah, but maybe that's part of the problem, is because they have to use science to open new culture stuff, or new policies, or new other things. So maybe you can use culture and have its own stuff. Oh well, yeah, but how or do you invest some other mechanic? It? The whole point is that you're investing into something costly that doesn't contribute to your defense or science. So you're taking resources that you have presently and putting them into something that can make you win, but it's also risky because you're pursuing something off the path. I I think you have to have at least a little science tie in there. Otherwise, you can just stay up in science and push culture all the time, and you'll win. And then everyone else will do it, too. So it just turns into a uh, culture versus military standoff thing. Yeah, I guess it depends on how it's built. I would like to see some stuff that don't require always fill the tech tree. There I agree with you, for (laughs) certain. (laughs) Because if you play the same way every time, with small variations at the end, there's less replayability there than if you had, like, unique gameplay mechanics for each route, for sure. Yeah. Tyler J89, tell me, how would you rank the unique luxuries in Civ Five? He says he knows salt is considered the master race, and calendar luxuries are generally disliked. Huh? I agree. What are your favorite yeah. and least? Yeah. What are your favorite and least favorite luxuries? <laughs> yeah, I read, I read it the exact same as you, Mackie. Like, uh, wait, what? Calendar luxuries are generally disliked. Uh. <laughs> What? I think what he meant to say is that the luxuries you can get sooner are better from a tech prioritization standpoint, I guess. It, it sort of depends because some, well, some people in the in the Reddit thread actually were putting, throw my bone there. putting the trapping-based resources above calendar. Hmm. Uh, like, I don't like the trapping-based ones. Yeah. No. Well, it's if you have, like, bad tech eight of them, then you can go Goddess of the Hunt. But other than that... Yeah. Yeah. If I'm stuck in the tundra, I'd absolutely love to have some of these resources, but then it's like, I'm in the tundra. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm in the <laughs> Let's get bigger. <laughs> it depends. Like, some tundra starts can just ruin you, but you know, sometimes you have decent land around, and your capital is really good with the trapping resources, so... Yeah, yeah. You get tons of trapping resources in the tundra. I will distinguish between, it's a tundra start, and I have tundra. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I see this because in the first post, they're talking about salt, marble, pearls, and gold, silver gems, which are all easier to get because that either you just pick up mining or sailing, which you, mining you're going to pick up anyway. But well, calendar's not that far of a diversion, especially if you want to go grab philosophy to start your national college. So I would certainly hope you'd want to grab philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the NC is kind of paramount to the game. So, yes. Yeah. And I guess it's a question of what calendar resources, because obviously not all are created equal. Um, and some suck. Yeah, yeah, completely. Yes. Yeah. Apparently they hate tiles that are pure gold tiles. In this case, they're talking about incense on a naked desert. But, but incense gets happy the goddess. And gold. Incense gets the goddess and and a religious building, monasteries. And if it's on the desert, you have this wonderful little thing called the Petra. And also desert folklore. You could be getting faith, yeah. too. And, and if you happen to be... A sieve that can do funky stuff. Morocco? Deserts. Yeah. And, I don't know. Naked deserts that aren't resources. I still don't like Morocco, though. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I, I'll blatantly ignore anything that's uh, straight up no no desert or just flat desert with nothing on it. As much as possible, anyways. 
well, not just uh, incense, but even also wine. I mean, if you don't pick up the Goddess of the Festivals Pantheon, plus one culture and plus one faith, there is the backup for all of these plantation-based resources, which would be oral tradition for plus one culture. Yeah, apparently they also don't like plus one culture from plantation. Yeah, we have, we have a little backup in the thread about incense being not so bad, particularly with Pantheon and monasteries. But they're also talking about they thought that sugar would be better if it gave plus one food and plus one gold instead of two gold. Oh, I'm sure they could mess with the yields on a lot of them. That's really where some of the luxuries are slightly imbalanced. Like, there's a number of luxuries, especially calendar-based, that have a lot of religious pantheons associated to them. So, you know, oh, I got this one. There's my pantheon. And I get cool stuff with that. Whereas you get yeah. something like sugar, and it's like, yay. That's where I can see the trapping stuff. Like, if you happen to get, like, trapping resources that are food resources and the trapping luxuries together, then it is a pretty strong start. Because you have those two food, one hammer tiles, like, surrounding you. So you have a good fast settler there. You can take Goddess of the Hunt, and it's a lot of food. Like, eight food in your capital or six food in your capital is a lot. You do get those starts here and there. So I can understand going that, like, if yeah, you get a clump of it. Yeah, I, just an ivory or two. I, I don't see it. Well, ivory's got the most gold output. It's a really high gold output tile. Yeah, I mean, it's not a bad tile, but I don't know that it's Plus, it's uh, if you don't have a horse, ivory counts for the stable. Don't. Yeah. For, yes, you can get... For base stuff. Trapping is just in the wrong tech path for me. Nine times out of ten. Same. The problem, I think, when some people start hating on the uh, calendar luxuries, and you can see it all throughout the thread, is that if a calendar luxury shows up in a marsh, that's just a, I'm never touching that until, like, medieval era. Settle on it. Yep, or settle on it. Or if it shows up in a jungle, then you need to go deeper in the tech to get rid of the jungle. Or if it's in a forest, you have to go, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Basically, it's like you need multiple techs to actually improve it. And because if it's on a marsh or a jungle, it takes forever to improve it. So you just don't, unless yeah. you have to. Or you've stolen, like, six workers. Yeah. Yeah, like the calendar-based luxuries, I would give Cotton the Edge simply because it will appear on grassland. Yeah, there's a few good ones like that. But Cotton doesn't do much and you don't get much of a yield out of it and that's part of the problem is it's not really balanced in that respect or at least as good as it could be any luxury that does not have an associated building or religious pantheon should have a higher base yield comparative to those yeah cotton gets at like all the calendar based ones with the plus one culture from plantations but that's not specific to cotton as opposed to say wine and incense oh goddess of festivals plus one culture and plus one faith for wine and incense yeah and it is cotton at least will tend to spawn on plain grassland so you're not having to wait for bronze working your stuff to chop it down and go over a jungle that way so you get to use not, it sooner that's not an insignificant factor that's pretty nope. important because you have it that many turns sooner yeah the luxuries aren't better. perfectly balanced, but in terms of resources, I think Civ 5 is probably the best out of the Civs, at least since yeah. they became unique. Like, okay, you go back to like Civ 1, 2 days where you didn't get much other than your strategics, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, why is it that when Phil said that, I immediately thought of Civ 3 and Saltpeter? Why? <laughs> why did I do that? Because why? I still have, uh, like, like trauma from not getting it when we really needed it. <laughs> Civ 3 and 4 are really bad with the resources. Yeah. The difference in start quality was just abysmal. You can still get screwed on a start in Civ 5, but it's nothing like the previous games. And in the thread, there does not seem to be a lot of focus on Citrus at all, which surprises me. Because of its tile yield, okay, yeah, you get it at Calendar, but then you tap into the Sun God Pantheon for plus one food. But Citrus can also appear on Grassland, and so that food growth so early on, okay, yeah, you've got to go to Calendar. But as we said before, you're going to go to Calendar. Yeah. You want to get to Philosophy. It's not that far behind. And I think that's really powerful because food translates into greater science output because you have more population and your cities grow, and then you have more production and more gold. And more this, and more that, and it just snowballs. So I, I think citrus is a strong second right behind salt. Yeah, well, I mean, if you're stuck in a jungle and you have citrus around you, it's actually worth not improving it for a while because you get more food from that tile for quite some time without actually improving it. Although you, you know? do need the happiness to grow using it. Yeah, yeah, you just so. hope that you get a different luxury or one that's yeah. not directly in jungle. Although if you do need the happiness and you've got multiple citrus, you can improve just one. Yeah, absolutely. Leave the others alone. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of agree. Citrus is actually pretty good. Marble is pretty high on the list oh, yeah, uh, for most people, but I don't know. I mean, marble's nice, but I don't really push over for masonry unless they have a lot of stone. 
Yes, because then stone circles plus two faith from quarries, which of course is stone and marble. I think a lot of people might put a little more stock in marble than maybe we are because of the production bonus and building ancient and classical wonders. Yeah, I don't do that. But I don't do that either. <laughs> so you know what I do? I like to conquer the cities that have those wonders. That's what I do. So you can go ahead and build them for me. That's great. I mean, if the production boost was greater earlier on in the game, I mean, 15%, it was like 25% when, you know, it used to be okay. But that, I mean, that would just be ridiculous. I mean, I'm glad it's only 15. Don't get me wrong. When I was ranking these, I ended up with 17. I mean, I put marble at six. It's very good, but it's not better than the gold, citrus. We've mentioned wine and incense. And then gold and silver. I put that right between citrus and wine and incense. All right. So you get the output. It's accessible at mining. You get the mint. So then each source of gold and silver gives you plus two gold with no maintenance cost, of course. And then you tap into religious idols, which, just like Goddess of Festivals, is going to give you plus one culture and plus one faith. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I'll, I will, like, jump all over gold and silver. Early game, those things just crank out the uh, money. And, of course, when I think about cranking out money in Civilization 4, I think of gems, which, in the case of Civ 5, I mean, I put that kind of right before marble. This is accessible at mining. It taps into the tiers of the gods, Pantheon. There's plus one faith for each, as well as pearls. But it is typically, you often find it in jungle, mm. and it's like, um, well. That's the settle on it plan. Yeah. Pearls, which is, again, with the tiers of the gods, Pantheon. Okay, there's crab and whales. They're nice, but then again, it's kind of like, okay, other than plus one production on fishing boats, which is Goddess of the Sea. I mean, that's nice, but... If you're coastal and you don't have much land, that's godsend. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Although that's kind of making the best of a not ideal position in that regard. Yeah, I put it like it's like smack dab in the middle of everything. Here's the one fun thing is that the water resources are always far more powerful than the land ones, generally, depending. It's just the problem that one jerk wandering around all of a sudden starves out your entire city because you can't work a single tile. <laughs> yeah. That's the problem. Oh, wait, and the supremely high cost for a freaking one-shot work boat. Mm, yes. Oh, I don't think we mentioned truffles. Truffles are good-ish. Yeah, yeah, they're not bad. And it depends how much clumping you have on the trapping resources. Yeah, yeah. The comment from Tyler J eighty nine about salt is considered the master race. <laughs> I think that's a bit strong. Salt is strong. Don't get me wrong. No, if, no, if, it's, if, it's, I was going to say look, it's the master of them all. Yeah, I, I mean, I go right for if I, as soon as I see salt, that's where I'm going. Oh yeah, I mean, it's top. When I hear master race, <laughs> I hear like they're at a hundred and second and below are at like fifty in terms of strength. I don't think it's that strong. Um, I, what's better? Well, well, Dan, yeah, Dan, you can take a crappy plain star and turn it to actually a decent star if you've got salt or desert. Mm -hmm. You get three or four salt. Yeah. You snap mining, and all of a sudden you're cranking out uh, settlers at three pop, as if you were another city cranking out settlers at five or six. You're just, like, wrecking the place. And you throw a pantheon on top of that. Boom. Okay, yes, 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 there's Earth Mother, plus one faith from each. And I think Salt's biggest advantage is how ridiculously common it is on the map as compared to everything else. Well, also, the yields that, are ridiculous. No, it's just, yeah, it's that strong of a yield early on. The sheer amount of food and production you get out of it, really, it should have been pick one or cut it in half. There's a fine line between perfect balance and conveying that it is a historical game. The thing is, is that being near Salt was a huge deal. Right? I mean, salt is way more important than gems or incense or wine or, or any of the other stuff that's going to be you know near you. It's a fair Except point, but it's a question of extent. Everywhere. That's the thing. The way luxuries work, it's either all grouped together in one spot and no one else gets salt, or all the city-states get it because then you accidentally got that. But the problem is the distribution of the luxuries are not set up in a historical way, whereas all around the planet, there's salt. But in the game, no. And that's where you have to pull away from the historical side of it and go, okay, it doesn't have to be perfectly balanced as in every choice is equal because then the game is boring. Because if every choice is equal, then there's no real choice. But they need to be balanced against each other for the strengths of each of those choices. So stuff like, you know, wine and, and dye and stuff like that, well, that all pushes towards the religious side, the culture. That was big for that stuff, and especially gold and silver and gems. They give pushes to different mechanics or different areas of the game, but doesn't make one choice way more powerful than the other, then that's okay. Proper forms of balancing, not blending it out. 
Yeah, you just want to avoid situations where one resource is so much stronger or so much more useless than the others that it starts becoming game deciding on its own. Yeah, I referenced the Civ 4 starts earlier because of how bad the disparity was. Like, if you got a corn and two gems versus a plains hill sheep and an ivory or something, the difference in your start position was just incredible. It got to the point where somebody who was like twice as good at me would lose if they got the ladder start, if I just rushed them because they wouldn't be able to handle it. <laughs> like, that's horrible. Athenaeum, do Maya have the biggest religion advantage? I occasionally play with my friend whose favorite sip is the Maya, and he always seems to have the most influential religion. Well, there's a surprise. Uh, this is because he rushes theology, so he can get long count started ASAP, takes a prophet as his first great person, and then usually gets a great engineer six or seven turns later and rushes more of a deer. But, well, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know it's probably not a good idea for him to waste his GE on Borobudur, but uh, I figure that even without wasting his GE on it, he could probably build it before anybody else anyway. Most people haven't found their religion by the time they get theology, and because the Maya have a shrine replacement that gives them plus two science and plus two faith instead of one, which gives them even more of a religion advantage, they can research slightly faster than most other sis and thus reach theology even faster. So he's one who knows, like, who else can compete with the Maya and if they are the strongest religion save. And, you know, if you go through the thread, you'll have a few sibs that are pointing out that if they get sufficiently lucky, they can be competitive with the Maya. But the Maya are pretty strong in religion, yes. And if somebody, like, sells their soul on religion, then <laughs> they're probably going to have a more influential religion. Yeah, I mean, do the Maya have the biggest religion advantage? I don't think so. Do they have a religion advantage? Yes. And just like with any advantage, whether it's religion or culture or what have you, it's also how well it's played, whether or not you're going to realize that. So, yeah, Maya very good. But when he says, is there any other Civ that could possibly compete with the Maya? I mean, the first Civ that comes to mind is Ethiopia. And then come the Celts. And then there's also this Byzantium civilization. Well... I don't know if they have an advantage, per se. <laughs> lucky Spain and Lucky Celts are also mentioned as... Yeah, I mean, it's kind of the question of, does the player rush theology? If they do, and they get there early enough, yes, they get lots of stuff from long count. And yes, they can use that stuff to use great engineers to spam stuff. I'm not exactly against the idea of wasting his G on Borobudur or any of the other theology-related wonders, because there's like three of them. Because if no one else actually has a religion at the point, it's really, really easy to spread your religion. Yeah, and it gets widespread very quickly because there's no competition. If you place those missionaries well, you can get a lot of presence on the map from that. Mm -hmm. And if you plow through all the stuff and you can enhance your religion properly, you're just wrecking the place before others can even get started. The problem is you have to get to the theology really quickly and hit the early long counts, and that's the hard part. As Brad points out, the earliest one is turn 52, or at least the earliest one that matters because you're not getting to theology before turn 52. 52, 62, 72. Every 10 turns, you're getting a new great person. On standard speeds. Yeah, on standard speeds and blah, blah, blah. And then it gets longer. So, you know, the faster you make it to theology, the more, the better you're going to be. But the problem is, if you really push theology that way, that means you blatantly ignored most of the tech tree. And if this is a multiplayer game, and you have the Maya, and you know they went theology, they have absolutely no units. Yep. Or much of anything else. So somebody could just wander along and go, do, 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 thank you for the wonders. Yeah, you look tasty, om nom nom. Although, like, the way he has his thread structured, I, this doesn't come across to me as a really competitive PvP game. No, no. Because, obviously, if you have someone who's rushing religion, rushing wonders, that kind of stuff, if you're actually in a competitive match with this person, the first thing that comes to mind is, well, just kill him. Yeah. <laughs> but he's not talking about that. He just wants to know, like, if anyone can compete on religion. Although somebody else actually did point that out. You know, if all this fails, well, rush. Mm -hmm. When he says, does the Maya have the biggest religion advantage, or does Civilization X have the biggest religion advantage, that's in and of the civilization itself. And just to add in here, I don't think you can avoid bringing into the question of the starting location of all civs, which actually ties a little bit back into the previous topic, because maybe you're not a civ that has a particular religion advantage, but perhaps you have a fair bit of gold and silver around you, or <laughs> desert. Or a faith wonder, faith national well, wonder. No, not even that. It's like you want to get it snowball started, run into two city states of the religious form. Oh yeah. Oh look, it's the Pantheon. That's true. 
And then there's also natural wonder considerations as well. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to be Spain to just use one of the good natural wonders to uh, just crank through a religion. Yeah, there's lots of reasons why you should ignore the map when it comes to who has an advantage. But then the map shows up and says, natural wonder, here you go. <laughs> exactly. Although maybe on average the Maya do have the biggest advantage because they can get some of this too. And then they're even further ahead on it. I think the Maya's biggest advantage is the ability, if you get to theology fast enough, you can grab a great engineer and crank out one of the wonders. Yeah. Or, you know. Just getting great, great people that fast great, that early. Yeah. You can use that to get other stuff. So say you take a great engineer first, pop out, pop your Hagia Sophia, get your free great profit. A couple turns later, you get your next long count and you take a second profit. And all of a sudden you have a fully formed religion in a few turns from nothing. Yep. Enhanced and everything. And then you go and you finish liberty and finish piety and <laughs> more great profits. <laughs> Now to spread this really strong religion that I got before the rest of you. <laughs> the plus science per shrine sort of just makes me want to go really wide. And if I happen to trip over theology at some point, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the civs that do have advantages, they have advantages more in the how you use the religion or how much faith you can get versus actually getting the religion. Because getting the religion kind of a kludge for most people if there's natural wonders on the map or religious city-states. Or, if nothing else, then you push for um, pottery and get your shrine constructed or bought. That's the worst possible way to do it. But that may very well be what you have to do if you don't have a particularly strong sieve with an advantage for religion or a start that's going to give you an advantage. You think, well, all right, I guess i got to get into the race somehow. Hmm, speaking about races, so how much production do you need for the World Fair and International Games? This is kind of a two-parter. Yep. So first part is one person actually just wanted to know how much production you actually need because he overdoes it a lot. Usually allocate too many resources, i.e. lots of production for multiple turns, and go well beyond the production required to actually win for the World's Fair, which is usually 50% or less if there's actual people producing for it as well. Yeah, it's easy to go over. It's really, really easy to go over. Oh, dear. Yes. And so this thread's pretty short, but generally the answer apparently is whatever you need for silver. So World's Fair is 350 hammers. Uh, you need a minimum amount of 350 hammers times the number of sieves in the game. That's nice, because then you can at least mathematically find out how much you need to push in. Of course, this all assumes standard speed, but yeah, part of the discussion actually gets into, well, you could choose to stop once you put in enough, but then lots of other sieves are going to get the bronze and the silver because there's all that extra production space. So why not just keep plowing through and then you're the only one who gets any bonuses as a thought line? Well, exactly. It's not just about what you gain by getting to that particular bonus, but what you deny to somebody else. Yeah. So it's like a double whammy. Yeah, <laughs> it could be a good gain. So the first 50% of your production is all about what you gain. The other 50% of the production is all about what you deny. And some of the denial stuff is good, like free social policies and extra happiness. Not having the AI get extra happiness when you're trying to jam your tourism down their throats could be useful. <laughs> For my, yeah, th them getting extra happiness has been a bad thing of mine. They always manage to have all the culture they're going to need. Ah, but that's what the great musicians are for. Yeah, we would rather the AI not get happiness from this because they already get dirt bonuses. They don't need yeah. more of anything, really. So the flip side of it, and the much longer thread, second thread was referenced from the first thread, so that's why I assume this is a two-parter. Yep. A trick for building world projects such as the World Fair to find out how much you're putting in versus what the AIs are putting in, you just hover over the World Wonder building icon. If you look at it every turn as you go, then you can find out how much you're contributing versus other people. And since you know your production amount, you know how much you're putting in. So it's a question of once you know how much you have and how much the World Congress is actually worth, then you can find out what your percentage is versus others. <laughs> this is fairly straightforward. If you don't put anything towards the World Congress or like to the to project and it goes up by 1%, then you also know that very few other people are bothering to put anything in there. But if it goes up by 40%, well, yeah. Yeah. You already lost a turn. If it goes up by that much, you've probably also lost. Yeah. Uh, just, yeah just don't worry about it if it's like that. 
Yeah. I don't worry about it. Yep. So you can basically track how fast others are putting production in versus yourself. So you can see if it's hitting 50% pretty quick, you're the only one putting production in, or there's a bunch of AIs putting a very little amount in, then the question really comes down to, and this comes up in the thread, do you want to just stop when you hit 50% and say, okay, I did mine, and then have to wait like 10, 20 turns for everybody else to put the production in to finish it, or do you just want it done so you can actually get the bonuses right away? Because more bonuses sooner is always better. I think you would generally want it sooner. I guess it's the question of, if you decide to stop putting production into it and you wait those 10 or 20 turns, what have you gotten out of it yourself? What have you then been able to construct in your cities that are no longer going towards the World's Fair or the International Games? And are you farther ahead? Construct some more military units, you know, because you don't have a lot of gold to buy them. So then that means you're going to be able to go on a rampage sooner. And, oh, look at that. Did you just get something from the World's Fair? That's nice, squish. But beyond those situational things, I think the sooner the better. Mm. Yeah, it depends on what you're trying to do. Like, if you're trying to win culture victory and you have a choice of getting plus 100% tourism or plus 100% culture now versus letting all the AIs or other players build up their infrastructure, cultural infrastructure that is, over that next 20 turns, Mm -hmm. yes, you would like to finish that faster so that you can break them quicker. And I think one thing that maybe some players might get too obsessed about, because it's an easy check to do, Okay, World's Fair, it has passed in the World's Congress, excellent, or International Games, or even the Space Station later on. I'm going to go to my demographics, and I'm going to see where do I rank on the production. Oh, look at that. I rank second, or I rank whatever, and then you start basing your decisions from that. Just because a civilization has considerable production infrastructure does not mean they're going to put it towards it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's a nice initial check, but like, I often do that more in terms of, do I want to propose the World's Fair at this point? Just because if I know I can be in the, like, okay, it depends on the number of civs on the map, but if I can get myself into the top third of production of civs on the map, then if all the other civs are going towards it, then I figure I have a reasonable chance that I'm going to place. Maybe if not first, obviously that would be ideally, but at least get myself the silver or bronze. Yeah, it sort of depends. You could be the worst production person in the world, but if everybody else is spending all their production on units or buildings or something, then you can just sneak right in there and easily gain something. So I don't think there's ever a reason not to do it, unless, of course, you're at that first turn thing where you're like, I put all my production into it and it's up to 40%. Yeah, okay, maybe not. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe it's time to walk away if you're really bad on the production, that is. Of course, in order to be able to construct the World's Fair International Games or Space Station, it needs to pass as a resolution. Now, sometimes a civ won't vote at all, either yay or nay. But if you know a whole bunch of civilizations voted nay against it, if it ends up passing, is there any kind of correlation between them voting yay or nay and determining whether or not they're actually going to start constructing it? I'm assuming not, at least not that we can measure. I that would, would have be to very look good the code. To know. I have a feeling that they're just opportunistic. Like, they may not want it because they're not going for, say, culture or whatever. So they don't want somebody who is going for culture to have it. But I would think they'd still be opportunistic if the production was available. Well, I know. I sure the hell I would, even if I didn't vote for it because I was <laughs> prioritizing something else. Well, it passes. Oh, well, I voted against it, so I'm not going to play. Oh, hell no. I'm playing. Yep. Let's do this. Yeah, because the last couple of times I've had like World's Fair and things come up in games that I single player games I've been playing, I've seen most AIs unless they were involved in a war and didn't have a lot of production at least put some hammers towards it. Yeah, pretty sure they're just opportunistic. I don't think you can correlate voting no with not spending any hammers. I think voting no is just they don't want culture victory that is, or somebody going for it. <laughs> Uncivilized brutes. Yeah, pretty much. Grinding your gears about yeah, the yeah, that's, that's, time. That's, that's... My biggest pet peeve is the turn times. And I know the cause of them. I mean, I work with uh, Brian Wade, who programmed a lot of that. He was the lead on it. And a lot of it boils down to minor factions. The uh, city-states are very expensive. They have that one unit per tile thing and the pathfinding necessary to deal with that, especially late game, especially with those minor civs in the city-states. That is very expensive. I wish they had been able to just thread that out or just not have them move as much. I mean, it's gotten a lot better since release, but still, I like to play on large maps, and that's one of the things that really slows it down for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really bad when you see, like, all of the actual AI turns go by and, like, two seconds 
and then you're just and then it grinds to a halt to go through city states and barbs and you're just like oh like my god 30 seconds later it's like well if those guys can make all their decisions and they have multiple cities yeah and in the case of the city states is because by the end game they're practically carpeting their files with units mm. yeah. well part of the problem was that I think initially they wouldn't move, and there used to be missions to construct a road. Yeah. <laughs> you never get into music, so you can construct the last couple of tiles, and you're like, oh my god. Nah, nah, nah. Yeah, but originally they used to build the road themselves inside their own territory, and then that stopped for some random reason. And then you had to actually go in, so they yeah. threw in a shuffle so that the AI would shuffle its units. But then once you start shuffling, well, then you have to pathfind for everything to shuffle, and that just gets ugly. And actually related to that, hey, we would like your religion in our city state. Yeah, that's nice. Have a- I'm trying to get the. Can I put the unit? The fuck? Come on, move. By the way, <laughs> my religion starts with a nuke. <laughs> <laughs> we shall bathe you in the glory of the nuke. Another grind of a gear. The rebase animation for air units is not tied to the animation system. That grinds my gears because if you turn animations off for movement, that does not stop the animation for rebasing air units. <sighs> so again, late game, air units flying all over the place. Oh, but hey, not late game. Getting spanned by every other civ by their uh, missionaries. Where is the option? Like you can tell them to stop spying. Get your freaking missionaries off my lawn and keep them off. No, you see, you have to let them spread it to you first before you can tell them to stop. Yes. That seems wrong somehow. So we're just reactive as opposed to being proactive. They're just asking for forgiveness rather than permission. That's how it works. Uh, That's right. Not for religion. <laughs> <laughs> I have a better religion than yours. Quit trying to spread your crap religion to my good one. There's unintentional pressure when it's up against <laughs> you, but I'm talking about the flood of missionaries and prophets that come to you. It's like, no. <laughs> it's always unintentional. Less. Always, always unintentional. <laughs> Well, when, when I'm on one continent, somebody's on another continent, and because something is going oh, with the thing, it, yes. it, yeah, you know, I'm not trying to spread to their continent. It's just the pressure's coming from my city to the city state and then jumps over. I'm not trying to do that. Okay, so fair enough. You don't want to wait for that to happen, Mackie. So I think then you have two choices. One is that you block them with your own units, or two, you declare war. Mm-hmm. Well, like I just said, I started a lot of wars because of <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the free great profit. <laughs> Hey, and you haven't used them yet. Great. More holy salts for me. Or if they have used it, and I've done this with the civ workers before, and I know it doesn't affect the AI at all, but I still like to do it. You move the unit right to their border, and then before they can take it, you delete it in front of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's important that I get satisfaction out of it. The AI doesn't know the difference, but I don't care. I feel better about myself. And I've just thought of this. I could go so gift it to a city state. Game. Yeah, you could. You could. And then they can just wander around with it and block your tiles. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if I do it on their continent, it's blocking their tiles. Uh, yeah, city states don't settle them or anything like that. They, yeah. they just they just hold it. I would say for me, uh, the city governor and deciding what tiles to. Oh my gosh, we're suffering on production. I just started a mine on a really great tile, but you will not let go of that two flute tile. Oh, governor, I tell you. You know, there's this ability to select yes. a tile. Yes. I was actually thinking more of tile acquisition on border growth. That okay. too. That one that is annoying. screwed up as hell. Well, that one, okay, I'll give you but that. Like, the citizen management in Civ 5 actually doesn't bother me because as a non-micro wizard coming from Civ 4, it's better. <laughs> Managing your cities in Civ 4 without the ability to lock tiles so you, that your growth is otherwise automatically allocated. And then you have like 20 cities instead of 4 to 6. It was a nightmare. You kids these days, you don't know how good it is compared to what it used to be. (laughs) I know it's bad. I know that the city will pointlessly starve you sometimes, so it's not good, but it is much better than before. So, like, for me, okay, it bothers me a little, but it doesn't reach grind my gears level because I remember how horrible it used to be. (laughs) And, of course, in the thread, there's the, I'm busy constructing a wonder, and then the turn before it goes away, I'm like, but this is what really grinds your gears in Civ 5, not what really grinds your gears in Civ. That's not a Civ 5 domain, that the wonder that you are constructing has taken the turn before. That's true. (laughs) That's all Civ games ever. That's just a learn-to-play new moment. (laughs) This not giving a damn editorial. <laughs> <laughs> There's also the I have enough faith to found a religion. Oh, that one is so freaking. And I ha- and the next turn and the next, next turn and ten turns later. Where the beep? 
And then, what do you mean you just founded a religion? How much over were you? No, how much over were you? How much over was I? Yes. Oh, come on. No, it's the, I have enough to found a religion. Great. Ten turns later, five religions have been founded. Yes. I don't have enough to, to found a religion. Oh, and then it's no more religions yeah, can be founded. founded. Oh. Yeah. Screw you. Ah. Yeah. Could you make the uh, over-under on the extra turns be, like, less than five? Like, flipping the table time. That's yeah. The heavy table. The very yeah. heavy table that normally you can't move. Rah! Okay, that's it. I'm out. Uh, that RNG, I don't know why. Seriously, I don't understand why that was RNG'd at all for the first two Great Prophets. It just annoys me to no end. Oh, you know what? I think that's just trying to add realism into gameplay. <laughs> and we shouldn't. And we've had this discussion <laughs> before. <laughs> Neither of these implementations are any, in any way indicative of reality, but we chose this one because it's realistic. <laughs> what? <laughs> Let's do it. Oh, hey, everybody. All right, so this is a topic for Civ 6, which Brad has already, you know, pre approved the existence. Announced, so we can talk about yeah, it. Yeah, uh, well, we're all running the beta, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. Of course. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> so, we agree yeah, I just talk about can't that. believe they made it real time. I mean, that's just... Yeah, I mean, it's Galsip 3, right? That's the beta? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> real time Civ 6. <laughs> okay, so there might be a Civ 6, and there might be combat workers, because uh, MC as well. In real life, combat engineers were being used during many time periods, and yada, yada, yada. Long post. I'm not... uh, what are you, Elaine? <laughs> yeah. Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> <laughs> yada, yada, yada. Yes, kids, there was their sweet. <laughs> he wants to know if we can use some sort of combat worker ish that can do frontline special improvements, stuff like that. So you, the whole logistical slash civil engineering stuff is specialized. Basically, it's a very specialized unit for the game. Now, granted, he makes mention that this is supposed to be a combat worker, but it would have equal strength to the weakest non-armored unit in the player's army, which at least for Civ 5 generally means equal power to the armored unit, or at least a close enough. So I, I would say let's make it a civilian unit, or like half the power, because he's talking about like not being able to spam these things and use them for cheap fighting. So yeah, you'd have to like make sure that it's not even remotely considered an actual military unit. Otherwise, combat workers can build and remove most of the improvements in one turn. Woo! Yeah, that seems fast. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, my that's a little... Whoa. Now, granted, granted, the things that combat workers in real life build tend not to last more than the amount of time it was required to put it there. Uh, yeah, but if you tried more. to build in a decay for that, that would just... You talk about <laughs> the turns taking too long now. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, like things like building a pontoon bridge across a river so that troops can go across without slowing down, that would be a combat worker thing. That would be good. One of the things that John's doing in Nata Gates is that you have to start out with before cities where you're dealing with tribes. And you have to actually go and get enough people to get that first city going. And I would love to see Civ kind of go a little bit further back where you're hunting and gathering and you're having to build up a little bit before you even found that first city. Well, an MCA is kind of getting to that because he says that in his suggestion, the combat worker can be built starting in the classical era or equivalent Civ Five tech era. So when I see that and also combined with that they can build as well as remove most of their improvements in one turn, I'm thinking, wow, why don't I just go ahead and declare war on this civilization over there? And then I can have my <laughs> my workers be combat workers, and away we go. Yeah, his general concept would be through the eras, basically you have camps or medical stations or military bases or improvised airfields, things people have wanted for a long time. So stuff like that where it's basically it's got defenses and you can heal there a little better and that sort of thing. And that makes sense. Like if you have a worker go and even in other people's territory, build a little base and says, okay, here you go can heal here a little bit better as if it was your own. It's in guard towers, apparently, so that range units can get extra sight. And the only thing I question on this is the wooden wall and the stone or great wall. Pretty sure China didn't build great wall in a turn, and it took a very, very long time to get it done. Yeah. Although he says two turns for the great wall. Uh, That's twice as long, Mad. Dude. Ooh, a whole two like, turns. In that kind of time period in the game, though, that is a few decades. And it's not nearly as long as the actual Great Wall in China, so... Oh, and we actually don't know how long the standard game of Civ 6 is going to be. Maybe it's only 50 turns. Yeah, that's that's it. There you go. (laughs) No, Um, um, no, anyways, 
building wooden walls and stone walls with combat engineers. Um, these are on the map, not related to the city. So these are actual hex-taking improvements, which to me, I think I like that concept because we did that in history. I yeah, like it as be, a tactical element. Cool. It's good. Yeah. Well, and I like uh, just a little farther ahead about the improvised airfield because I immediately thought mm-hmm. back to Civilization IV. That was great. It's like, okay, I've got these airplanes and, oh, I don't have any coast. Okay, so I can't put it on a ship and I want to bombard. Okay, let's put it in an airfield. Oh, wait, no, that's okay. I'll put it in this city and it's, I'm sorry, it's one hex out of range of the... Uh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I did actually. That's what airfields. nukes are for, Dan. Nukes there would always be like a one tile or one hexile, and you could have put one on that was off the coast. It would have been great. He eventually gets to minefields and stuff like that as well. I like the medical stuff. station idea because that's like the mobile hospital type of things. Yeah. But the weird part is, is like medical hospital and repair station used to repair these things. The enemy can also use it. What? If they capture <laughs> it. Like if they move into that province, that's fine. Or, um, yeah. yeah, if you capture it. But it's like. I'm building a medical station. I'll heal everybody. <laughs> oh, I think the abstraction would be reasonable that your yeah, that you dudes muscle it. out their dudes, and now you're, they're using their supplies. Yeah, yeah, probably. Look, unless we're starting to introduce aliens into the uh-huh. game, in which case one medical station. <laughs> I thought Brad would approve. Yes. <laughs> is there anything in his suggestions that I'm not sure I like is the city-based ones, like the old oil cauldrons. Uh, having a mm-hmm. unit walk into a city to build something seems a little weird when you can just tell the city to build it itself as a defensive building. But otherwise, the concept of having a combat worker, actual an actual unit that wanders around building forward stuff, like camps and things like that, very plausible. I mean, it's an idea. The only question is, how big is your map? Smaller maps, that could get really ugly pretty quick. Especially if you're ripping up other people's improvements. Oh, yeah, the concept. I really like the concept as well. There are just some minor parts about his suggestions or her, yeah. I shouldn't assume, Whatever. implementations that we take issue with. But that's pretty minor in the grand scheme of things. I mean, he's put some considerable thought into this. He's thought about not only is it a good concept because there's realism, but here's how it could work in gameplay. And, yeah, I mean, even some of this, regardless of what a Civilization Six becomes, even some of this, I could actually see this in Civilization Five in a mod. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or um, way down there, Ozzy Hucker is thrown in. Like, a use for them in peacetime could be building trade forts, hmm. i.e. building a fort in a neutral territory. You can connect it with trade routes. That sort of concept would be cool. You might have to think and do math for how far you can get with it and multi-staged trade routes. But... Ooh, thinking is okay, but does it have to be math? I mean, I don't know. You know. we don't want to have math. No. Doing math in your head is the best part of games. <laughs> Here's your I wrinkle. To stop and pull out the spreadsheet to do all your work. <laughs> like, Hold on, people. I'll be back. Got to do my work. <laughs> should be a tooltip for everything. Yes, a tooltip comes up with a spreadsheet in a tooltip. <laughs> this okay. tooltip will explain to you what actions you can take that will most greatly annoy the other players in the game. <laughs> By the way, opening this tooltip, like the game. <laughs> Tool tip: How to calculate how much pressure is required to smash your monitor when you get angry. What? Press this button to do a denial of service attack on Dan. Oh. There's feedback for uh, episode 227. Shaglio is saying, first started discussing optimal teams to gang up on the AI. His first thought was Mongolia and Songhai. Reason being that the ranged attack of the Keshiks coupled with the uh, Mandekalu cavalry would be able to just sweep across the map. And while they certainly could, like I said in the thread, I don't see the advantage because if you've taken a city down to no strength, you can take it with basically anything, including just a random horseman or whatever. So, like, I don't think that those cavalry would particularly speed up your progress or be stronger than just doing something that makes the Keshiks better or the camel archers better or just throwing in horse archers sooner or whatever. It doesn't strike me as particularly outstanding in that regard, which is why I responded the way I did in thread. Yeah, no, I basically agree. Because you're going for two UAs at the exact same tech, which seems like an idea. But, yeah, if you've already got Keshiks or Camelot troops, then you really don't need Mandico. You can just use scouts at that point. Yeah. 
Although having something with more moves is nice. Yeah, it is nicer, but you could just use uh, You could just use, like, a knight or a horseman, and it'll still take a zero hit point city or one hit point city mm-hmm. without too much trouble. Call, Call in today. today. In North America, the number is 301-637-7659. That's 301-637-POLY. In Europe, 44-121-288-7659. That's 44-121-288-POLY. The only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. For more information on Polycast, our sibling shows Modcast, Revcast, and Turncast, or about Polycast in general, log on to the series' official website at thepolycast.net. That's basically the premise of Galactic Civilizations, is that built your ship in Civ, and now you're going to go out and colonize the planets. Yeah, I remember the campaign. It was good. You play the campaign? No, no, I'm not talking Galsa 3. I don't think I'm going to bother with that garbage. Um, Oh, oh, oh. Oh, wow. (laughs) No, the campaign. (laughs) Oh, okay, I was going to say. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not talking about your game. Like, your game is garbage. I didn't just say Galsif 3 sucked. <laughs> well, you sure. kind of did, but... <laughs> did that campaign thing. No, no, Galsif 3 is actually more about the multiplayer and, like, the not campaign stuff. The big thing in Galsif Civilization 3 is just the scale of it. You can have 100 opponents in a single-player game, you know, 100 AI players going against you if you want. Mm-hmm. And no, no, I'm, you're hearing I'm... it. You're hearing it. Imagine thinks that Galsif 3 has something in common with Call of Duty. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I would say... Galaxy 3 is as much of a multiplayer game, I guess, as Civilization 5, which is to say around a percent and a half of the player base will probably play. <laughs> oh, I thought you meant that you're basically saying it's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Yeah, stick to it's the Call of Duty analogy, actually. The Call of Duty analogy. There you go, Brad. Got to Civilization 3. Call of Duty in space. <laughs> in space. <laughs> Biggest selling title ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think the uh, Call of Duty uh, fan base would exactly like uh, playing a turn-based strategy game, but we have if it does that. Uh, I'm just picturing the little kid trash talk in the framework of a Galsiv game right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. There's an important qualification here, Brad. That'd be amazing. <laughs> Brad, they don't have to like playing it, they just have to buy it. That is true. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> Gospel asks... Why not bring up some news on an upcoming title called Civ Six? And well, see, I... here's the thing: they haven't told us crap about it yet, so we can't tell you crap about it yet. No, but I'm just saying. Like, although if we keep the Brad new Roman numeral, we can have Civi. It could look like Civi all the time. I'm gonna yeah. play some Civi guys. Oh, play it in your Civis? Oh, yeah. how do you do that? Because <laughs> play yeah. Civi. Oh in my God, Civi. that's uh, that's yes. <laughs> that's a yo dog already. Look at that. That's perfect. Play in your civvies. You don't have to be commando anymore. Mm-hmm. But you still well, can't be a few Well, you can, but... You know. We brought gospel the truth, because Brad is here, and Brad knows all about the six. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're right. Anyway, this has been Polycast 228. I'm Makalua, as usual, and with me, of course, is Dan. Brad will be replacing Mad Jin next episode. Mad <laughs> 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 <Dad Jin. laughs> Ah, thanks, everybody. <laughs> me and team... You agree with me, so you are obviously correct. And our guest this week, who is not going to be the new co-host, Brad <laughs> Well, thank you very much for having me. It was fun. Which may or may not be an insult, depending upon their disposition. Maybe they like it. Now, there are a lot of things that people like that others don't. Yeah, <laughs> but what really grinds your gears? Well, that might be some things that people like and others don't. Oh, yeah. oh wait, that's kind of grinding how many, gears. How many segues can we throw at Brad before he picks it up? <laughs> <laughs> All of them. I don't know. Let's All get the physical segues. segue and throw it at your head. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> that would be slightly expensive. How far can you throw a segue, Dan? Well... 
Uh, are we into the grinding your gears about the... Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, 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 that's what we've been... <laughs> yes, the gears of the segue will be grinded <laughs> against the skull. Grim is now, what do you guys think about the combat worker? Uh, we're moving to the next topic right away. Oh, 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 oh. oh you, guys want, you guys still want to rip on Civ Five? Sure. The precious. Actually, we're usually pretty complimentary. Yeah, well, it's something that grinds your gears isn't necessarily a rip on the game. So you can just, like, edit Brad's segue in there so that I don't have to actually make a new one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could, but should I? Benefits to post editing. <laughs> Record date? May 16, 2015. Civilization 4, 5, and Beyond Earth Sound Clips. Copyright Take 2 Interactive. Copyright Civilized Communication at civcom.net.